everybody to Integrate Yourself. I'm your host, Allison Polo. You can find me at pureenergypdx.com. Today, we are here with a really special guest. His name is Mike McCastle. He is also a, a co-worker of mine. We work at uh, Evolution Healthcare and Fitness together, and that's originally how I met Mike. Um, but Mike is a sponsored American endurance athlete, a four-time world record holder. He's, nationally claimed, he's a nationally claimed performance coach and a motivational speaker. After serving 11 years in the U.S. Army, McCastle founded 12 Labors Project, a company and charitable initiative driven by a purposeful mission to push the limits of human potential in hopes of inspiring others to explore their own capacity for greatness. With over a decade of experience in the field, high achievers in the athletic, military, and corporate sectors have enlisted McCastle's experience with the goals of improving performance, mental strength, productivity, leadership, and team cohesion. In addition to collegiate, professional, and national level athletes, Mike's clientele have included teams from Microsoft, Amazon, the FBI, U.S. Navy SEALs, and elite polar explorers, to name a few. His efforts to and expertise in human performance have been featured in the New York Times, USA Today, HBO Real Sports, NBC News, Men's Health Magazine, U.S. Veterans Magazine, plus many more local and national news media outlets. In his free time, Mike act, remains actively involved in a number of charitable efforts centered around veteran uh, mental health issues, Parkinson's disease, and muscular dystrophy research. He is the current student uh, Veterans of America chapter president and at Concordia U University, where he studies psychology and exercise and sports science. Mike, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here today with me, and we're going to talk about some amazing things. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad to be on your show, and it's been a long time coming. Oh, it definitely has. This, has been, this is an exciting moment that we finally made it happen, right? Um, so we're going to talk about, Mike and I talked earlier about uh, the subject of flow state, which he is really experienced in talking about. He's talked about this to many groups of people, and uh, his take on flow state is, is very interesting because he did a lot of personal experiments on them, which he can, he's going to share with everybody today, but also he used these techniques and tactics, I think, with the U.S. Navy SEALs, right? Is that how you started with the flow state? Yeah, working with the SEALs um, in Coronado is kind of where I started uh, uh, attaching the tools, the psychological tools to the state itself. So I was already experiencing the state. I was an air traffic controller. So, um, you know, in that environment, you know, you got a lot of novelty, complexity, challenge, a lot of the key ingredients of flow um, I was already um, kind of plunged into. So then when I started working with the SEALs, um, I started learning the, the science behind it, kind of like the tools and the methodology behind um, how to really go into these states at will um, to encourage um, higher attrition rates um, among SEAL candidates, or I'm sorry, to, to decrease the attrition rate among SEAL candidates. And you had mentioned uh, that they were, um, and they got to a point where they, they, it wasn't a physical thing that they didn't think they could handle, right? It was more mental. And that's when you realized, hey, there's something to this. Right. Um, so to, to get into the SEAL program, it's a very highly competitive program physically. So you know, just to get into the door, just to be considered as a candidate, you have to be a, 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 a pretty much a physical specimen. We get, we get athletes from, um, you know, uh, Division One sports, professional athletes, Olympic athletes. We get a lot of really qualified, physically qualified people, yet the attrition rate still, you know, hovers around, you know, 80 percent. Why is that? Um, it, there has to be another uh, factor, another reason why uh, people are quitting and, and failing out. Um, and it's the mental. It's uh, you, uh, your ability to stay focused. Flow follows focus. It, it's, it's a scientific term to describe a way that we have evolved to, um, to stay present. Mm. It's a scientific term to describe a way that we have evolved to be drawn into the moment. Um, and when we get distracted, when you lose that physicality, kind of um, it, it, you lose its, its, its value. 
it becomes more about the mental in that case, because if you can't stay focused on the task, um, how can you apply the physical effort toward a big uh, goal? So, What was creating the resistance in people was causing people to not be able to get into the flow state, you know, like what was that mental block that people were experiencing that you found? Like, how were you able to help them find that for themselves? Uh, well, you- uh, I get, well, just first of all, I guess we should have a clarification of terms. So we're all on the same page. Flow is, um, is described as an optimum state of consciousness where you feel your best and you perform your best. And this gotcha. is especially true when it matters most. It's a very pleasant state. Um, you know, time seems to, to uh, time dilates, you know, hours can pass by. It feels like seconds, a phone call with an old friend could feel like, you know, for hours could feel like five minutes. It's very selfless. And this is the thing uh, that I think um, uh, is directly contributed to the, 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 the high attrition rate is because flow, um, it silences your inner critic. It silences the self-talk, right? The negative self-talk. And we know now that the mind and body is connected. Um, and what you think and feel is gonna manifest itself in your physical performance. It's gonna manifest itself in your behaviors. So if you're constantly, um, if, that, if that critic in your head is constantly uh, negating any forward progress that you want to, you're wanting to make in the face of challenge or adversity, it's gonna take its toll and eventually, uh, you know, what could start out as a tiny seed is gonna grow and grow and become overwhelming. And it's gonna cause you, a quit, cause you to quit regardless of physicality. Um, you know, we see it across the spectrum from your recreational athlete to your SEAL candidate to the Olympic athlete. There's champions who um, they get anxiety and nerves about being number one in the world, about, about getting that gold medal because of the, um, the fears and doubts and, 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 and um, the unknown that's associated with that. So they'll pull back their performance and it has everything to do with our prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for our inner critic, it's responsible for our, our that negative self-talk. It's the cognitive function um, part of our brain where we're aware of our, uh, you know, we're this agent in control of our destiny, and it's the high executive functioning part of our brain. And in flow, that part of our brain actually goes quiet, mm-hmm. so we don't have that 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 critic in our head constantly telling us that we can't do it, constantly telling us that we bit off more than we could chew. We are present in the moment. And so our ability to silence that critic is is critical to flow. And it's actually one of the uh, key environmental triggers to flow. And we can talk, go more in depth in that um, later into like what actually triggers flow. Okay. So before we actually get into that part of it, I would like to just kind of, because you and I talked about the difference between flow state and detachment. So it could sound a little bit like detachment, but it's not the same thing. Because right. detachment is not really being fully present. Is that is that true? Yeah, it's quite the opposite of flow, right? Yeah. Um, flow is actually being completely present and completely mindful of your surroundings. And, and that's uh, all your physical senses. Um, that's your proprioception. Um, that's, that's everything that... Um, you know, sight, vision, touch, hearing, everything that, that we can sense all combined into one. And being detached from something is kind of separating that into its constituent parts. And you don't want to do that in full. You want to be drawn. You want to be completely present um, and use all your, all your senses. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> that so detach- was great. Detach- yeah. Yeah, detachment is, is different. Um, it's kind of like being, you know, on autopilot, right? Autopilot mm-hmm. is it? Autopilot isn't being in flow. You're driving in your car. You're on the highway. Oh, uh, oh I'm at right. work now. That's not. That's not flow state. You know, yeah. runner's high. You know, oh, where did where, where did the last couple of miles go? I feel really good. It's kind of like a low grade flow state. But it, to truly be in flow really takes um, a lot more than a lot more than that. There's a lot more going on um, in your mind, in the brain, neurologically. Uh, than just a, just a simple feeling of feeling good and, and losing track of time. So let's get into that. Let's get into more detail. And, and I know that you, you know, um, and I want to also mention real quick that I kind of kind of lose you a little bit. I, I don't know what the, um, what the uh, internet connection is like there, but it seems to be kind of going in and out a little bit. So it's not okay. terrible. I can still like understand a lot of what you're saying, but um, every once in a while you're freezing a little bit. So, yeah. 
Okay, let me uh, do just a quick troubleshoot. Yeah, sure. And I'll try to solve that problem. Okay. All right, we can continue. Okay, thank you. That's awesome. Um, so we, where we left off was, now I can't remember. <laughs> You're going to get into some specifics here of how to get into the flow state, I think. Well, there you go. That's or a perfect how? segue because distractions is one thing that takes us out of flow. Oh, right? tell me about it. Oh, my God. So that's the, <laughs> that's, the one, that's the most important thing. So like I said, flow follows focus. And all the triggers to get into flow are things that uh, we have biologically evolved to draw us into the moment. So distractions would be the, the agonist to, to, to flow state, right? Everything, so many things in our life are always pulling us away from the now, whether it's in the future or the past. If, if, if now, if focus is, is our razor's edge of performance, if focus is right now, uh, then, and then I spend, let's say I spend 25% of my time thinking about um, the past, something that happened to me earlier in the day, the guy who cut me off in traffic, something my boss said to me, my coach said, you know, criticized me. And then I spend 25% of my time thinking about, well, how terrible this day is going to be now because of why that happened, because of those things that happened. What is left for me right now? What percentage is left for me right now in the moment? My razor's edge is dull. I'm, I'm left with 50%. And a lot of times we just do that. We go through life at this kind of, excuse my French, but this half ass state of focus <laughs> because yeah. you know, 50% of our focus is being pulled away by fixations and distractions, mm -hmm. emails, social media, personal baggage, um, relationships with our friends, all these things. Our brain is capable of operating up to a, a hundredth of a, of a second, yeah. right? These things, these distractions show up before your alarm clock go up in the morning. And they're oh, wow. immediately pulling you away. And um, so your ability to silence those distractions just for one second, if you can do it just for one second and just string those seconds along. And the thing about flow and focus is it's fluid. It moves with you moment to moment. And it doesn't care about the past. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. It's being present right now and what's in front of you. And, and that creates an environment in which you can deep, go deep in the flow. Um, deep embodiment, uh, uh, you know, you know, having that rich environment is another, another key trigger for flow, having an environment that is going to challenge you. Um, mm -hmm. if you're stuck, if you're stuck with a task, that's too difficult. Um, and you're, you're going to just throw in the towel, you know, why give the effort is too hard. If you're stuck with a task that's too easy, you're, you're, you're going to fall into boredom. Mm -hmm. So you got to find that sweet spot between boredom and extreme anxiety or stress. <laughs> And there's that middle ground. There's like that uh, Goldilocks zone in which we can really fall deep into that flow state. Um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, which is the, you know, the researcher back in the seventies who actually coined the term flow, um, mm -hmm. understood this. He understood that in order to um, find that right uh, amount of challenge, he said to challenge yourself about 4% more than what you think you're capable mm -hmm. of doing. 4% yeah. more than what you think you're capable of. It's not too challenging, not too easy. Um, and that will create the environment that is because there, there has to be consequences. Mm -hmm. The things in life that draw our attention are things where there is a high consequence, whether that's a professional consequence, a social consequence, a physical consequence. For someone who's shy, it could be walking across the room and talking to that girl or, or guy, mm -hmm. right? That poses a social consequence. So that immediately is a trigger that will put you in the flow state. Or begin to put you in the flow state because it draws right. your focus and, atten and attention into the moment because you don't want to mess up, mess up your, your chance. Right. Um, in a meeting, in a professional setting, it could be raising your hand and, and bringing up a, a valid point that you might that have, might have been lingering on in your head, right? That fear, that hesitation yeah. that you might have, that draws you into the moment. You're, you're thinking of the words you're going to say. You're thinking of how you're going to express this, this thought. You, you don't care about lunch. You don't care about, you know, what you ate for breakfast. You want to, you want to, participate this point in the best way possible because yeah. um, back you know we talk about like when we were back in our tribal um, days um, being judged by our peers um, in a negative way could have could lead to you being outcasted right mm -hmm. and, and if you were outcasted out of your tribe that's a death sentence that yes. meant you're pretty much going to die if you're you know especially nomadic 
you're done. So it's the worst that, thing it could, that could happen at that time, probably. That yeah. So we have that fear. And that's why um, the number one fear in the world is the fear of public speaking. And it's not mm-hmm. like being mauled by a grizzly bear. Right. <laughs> right. The, brain the brain doesn't know the difference between a physical um, stressor and an emotional stressor. It sees it as one and the same. So. Wow. That's I, incredible. What's that? High consequences is one way, is the one trigger to get into flow. It's an environmental trigger, the flow state. Yeah, I never thought about it like that, but it, it can it can be an everyday occurrence that puts you in the flow state and, and just one moment in time, which makes a lot of sense. And it's exactly. something you can continue to become aware of, and that's a practice, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. What are some other triggers to get us into flow state? Is that the only one, or is there, are there more of them? There are, ma- there are many. Um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi really um, had like nine core ways to get into flow. Um, what re- research has found now, especially with the advent of our you know, technological um, advancements, we have fMRIs to really take a look under the hood and see what's going on in the brain during different experiences. And what uh, you know, Jamie Wheel and uh, Stephen Kotler um, uh, work with the, with the Flow Genome Project, they've actually found 17 uh, triggers to get into flow. And they all have to do with things that draw us, things that make us focus, things that draw us into mm-hmm. the now. And there's social, there's an environmental triggers. There's a lot of different types of triggers. Another one is deep embodiment. And that's mm-hmm. spatial awareness, right? That's, that's being aware of where you are in time and space. We okay. walk around in our daily lives just a head on a stick. Fifty percent of our nerve endings are in our hands and in our feet and in our face, but we really, we rarely um, integrate those senses into our everyday life. Mm. Um, we learn, kids, children learn better um, when they see something, when they process it, and when they actually go and get hands on and actually go and do it. Like you'll, you'll know more about a windmill if you learn about it, and then you go and build one. So it's the process right. of actually embodiment and getting in an environment where actually using your hands and, and incorporating all your senses, right? When you're on a uh, rock climbing, we see flow in, in a lot of action adventure sports because when you're hanging off of a wall, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's either flow or die, right? High consequences, yeah. deep embodiment, awareness of where you are in time and space and gravity. Snowboarding is another one. Um, mm-hmm. Surfing. You know, and then the, these cultures, um, of, you know, these subcultures of these action adventure sports, they create names for flow, right? They call it, you know, uh, being, uh, being in the flow in, in the, in the snowboarding, um, adage is, you know, don't feel, you know, don't force the feel, feel the force, don't force the feel. Oh, Mountaineering, yeah. they say, go slow to go slow to move fast. Right. Because mm-hmm. if you slow down and stay present in the moment and you're methodical, um, and meticulous about your movements, you're going to move a lot faster than if you rush and, and, and just only thinking about the summit and you're dropping your ropes, you're dropping yeah. your gear. It's going to take more time um, and more risk is going to be involved that way. So it's all yeah. about slowing down your mind. You know, the old, you know, the old belief was, well, we only use 10% of our brain. So to, to go into flow, to really reach high performance, we have to unlock more of our brain. Well, that's been debunked. Because with fMRIs, what they're seeing is that the brain actually quiets down. The mm-hmm. prefrontal cortex actually shuts down, right? And we're able to, that's where time dilation. That makes sense. Out. You're saying in the prefrontal co- cortex is kind of where a lot of the busy thoughts are in some ways, or, or just kind of thinking and, and um, managing those thoughts basically throughout the day. You're saying this quiets down, and then that's when you're in the flow state basically? Absolutely. It's called transient, um, you know, researchers call it transient hypofrontality. Transient being it's temporary, right? It's a Mm -hmm. passing state. Hypo meaning it's opposite of hyper, meaning slow down, um, you know, shuts off. And frontality meaning the um, prefrontal cortex. So transient hypofrontality. Um, And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing what we can do when we just, when we just be mindful of where we at and we just, we're just kind of present uh, to the moment. Yeah. It's really a, an amazing thing. 
It makes me think like how helpful, you know, going back to things like that have been around for a long time, like Qigong and Tai Chi and just, you know, going through that kind of slow movement and how helpful that can be for getting into the flow state, like you're saying, or just being healthy, you know, just because we have, we our, our society is so fast, you know, everything is fast. It's really, there really isn't much room for people to process things slower here, especially with, you know, the internet, we've got all this information coming at us nowadays. Uh, it's, we're kind of feeling that, that speed, like we have to be in a certain, that, that rhythm of just take it in, take it in, take it in, you know, but I can, I mean, there has to be a balance. And I think there, there's, it's a good idea, especially for athletes too. And, you know, people who are doing extreme sports to be able to get into that flow state, because if you're not, you're going to get hurt. You know, it's not going to, you're not going to perform as well probably as you could. Uh, there was one time where I remember distinctly being in that flow state where time just stopped. I was in the middle of the air over a balance beam and it was the weirdest thing in the world. It's the first time I like experienced it like that before. I literally like, I was like, oh, I'm up in the air. I can see the beam. Oh, okay. I just put my foot down right there. You know, it was like just everything was just like perfect, you know, like, but it was really it was like you said, like time stopped and I just knew exactly where to place my foot, exactly where to land. Everything was totally straight. And then all of a sudden time kicked in again, you know? So it was really interesting. It's, um, it's a really interesting yeah. phenomenon. <laughs> and that is a perfect example. Well, let me ask you this. When, when you did, a, did that move on the balance beam, did you, get, did you have that feeling on the first time you ever did it or did it did it take you a few tries to actually? Took me a long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was when I was really, yeah, I'd really mastered it. Yeah, definitely not the first time. Yeah. That's the thing about flow too, is it, it accelerates learning. It makes learning enjoyable. Once you hit that, that, that move, you immediately had a feedback. You felt good. You felt great. You had a, a neurochemical dump in your head of dopamine, <laughs> serotonin, endorphins, all the feel good chemicals and your brain said, yeah, that's good. Give me more of that. I want to learn more of that. What it did was it actually um, sped up your brain's ability to, to retain that information. You retain information faster. They did studies on uh, snipers and flow and they took people who are basically novice snipers or novice marksmen. And um, they, they used, um, you know, they pretty much knocked out their, their prefrontal cortex with mm -hmm. electrodes. Um, and what they found was um, their, their time to learn the base, the skills of, of marksmanship um, from beginner to advanced um, was cut in half, 50% faster um, than their wow. steady, state, steady state peers who were not um, in flow, right? And they've done this test with pilots. And, um, but it's important to understand the cycle of flow, the flow cycle, because people that are hearing this might be thinking, well, this sounds too good to be true. You're telling me that I can drop into this flow state, boost my productivity by 500%, right. feel great about it. And, and, you know, like, That's what I was thinking. Like, why do we need this? Problem. Right. <laughs> if we, right. <laughs> but yeah, there has Everything, to be, there has to be a balance a, there, right. Is where you're going with it. It sounds like. Right. Yeah. There is a cost uh, and flow is no different than any, um, uh, flow state releases some of the most potent neuro neurochemicals on the planet. Mm. Uh, in, into your brain, we release it naturally than any synthetic drug can release. That we can, oh, wow. that if we were to take the equivalent of the, uh, the the neurochemicals that we can synthetically make, if we if we were to take that equivalent, we'd mm -hmm. die. We would overdose. But our brain, our minds release it naturally, and we have to wow. understand what the flow <laughs> cycle is. Yeah, we, you're that powerful, right? Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so the thing is, like, so flow, like, to, to use your gymnastics uh, um, experience on the beam, flow, um, like the first of Buddha's four, Buddha's four noble truths, flow begins with struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Life is suffering, flow begins with struggle. So again, it begins with that, that challenge. And this is a difficult part of flow. This is a unpleasant part of flow. You're studying hard. You're cramming for a test. Yeah. You're, 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 you're beginning the planning process for writing a blog or the planning you know, process of writing a book. It's an unpleasant experience. You're like, okay, here we go. Got to do this. Got to hit this beam. I got it. And you're, and you're really prefrontal cortex. You're thinking of the steps. Mm -hmm. Conscious thought is very, is not energy efficient. It takes a lot of energy to use conscious thought and it's very slow conscious thought is. 
Mm. Unconscious thought with low resides is very fast, very fast. And it's very energy efficient. Uh, we're able to do a lot more with a lot less um, buy-in in unconscious thought where flow lives. So the cycle of flow is, okay, we're presented with a struggle, we're presented with a challenge. In your case, it was hitting this move on the balance beam. You've tried it a, a thousand, hundreds of times before, didn't quite land it like you, like you wanted to. The second stage, and, and so your, your anxiety is up, your stress is up, you're kind of frustrated. The second phase of flow is called the release phase. Now, this is the phase where most people, or a lot of people, they often step away from the problem. They say, mm -hmm. okay, I've had enough for right now. I'm going to step away and I'm gonna come back to this later. Or you don't come back to it, right? Maybe you chuck your laptop against the wall or you know, <laughs> I'm done with this project or I'm done with this move. So in your case, it was in the form of practice. You practice a day, okay, I'm done for today, I come back tomorrow, practice mm -hmm. again. Still didn't nail it, I'll come back tomorrow. So after this release phase, right, and you come back to the challenge, your brain now releases uh, the, uh, that potent dump of neurochemicals. Uh, mm -hmm. nitric oxide right it flushes out all those stress hormones it flushes out all those the cortisol levels and it replaces it with this 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 cocktail of feel-good chem neurochemicals the endorphins the serotonin the dopamine and you enter what's called the flow state which is the third part of this cycle now like any drug or any um, gland in our body we only have a limited supply of all those mm -hmm. feel-good chemicals we only have a limited supply of of um, these these neurochemicals so flow is not a permanent state and that's what people need to realize you can't drop in the flow one day 30 years later you're still in flow it's not like a coma state that you can just be it's limited and what follows flow is is the the, the recovery phase mm -hmm. right so we've done the task we've accomplished it and then we're left in this recovery phase which is kind of like this deep sense of it's, it doesn't feel really good it's kind of like this deep sense of wow, that was really amazing. I want more of that. And yeah. we spend the rest of our lives chasing that feeling because oh, now man. we feel like we're missing it. Yeah. So you had that moment, you felt time slip away and you were talking about it today like it was just yesterday. Hmm. I'm pretty sure you've tried to replicate that feeling in other areas of your life. Um, yeah. Chasing the next struggle that's going to dump you into a flow state, the right. next challenge. So the thing to, to, to note here is that the recovery phase and the struggle phase is back to back. Mm. So if you can recognize what phase of flow you're in, right? Yeah. That's gonna help you accelerate that process. It's gonna help you find your specific triggers that, that will put you into that flow state. And, it's, and you, have to, you have to understand how the cycle works in mm. order to do that. Before, um, you know, scientists thought flow was binary. It was like an off switch that you turn off and on. You're in flow or you're out of flow. Mm, what we mean right. now is that's not the case. There's phases and cycles. There's a cycle to it. That's really amazing. Yeah. And, and do you, do you help people do you, with the cycles? Do you help people identify what cycle they're in during the flow state? You, you, you just worked with Colin and he is a um, extreme sports guy. I mean, he just, he just uh, was in the Arctic and he successfully made that trip. And I don't know if you want to share with everybody um, what that was about. And you got to go on real sports to, are you going to real on real sports or have you already been on that show to talk about it? Uh, I can't remember if you, tomorrow if you were morning. on it tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Okay. So it's coming up. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, you know, that's a great example of, I would say of how you help people. I mean, sure you helped Colin through that process, I'm guessing, because he had to go through some real extreme environmental factors there. Sure. Um, well, with Colin, you know, Colin was a, a, a unique and interesting experience. He was Colin, you know, being a, an extreme athlete already, being having a background in professional triathlon, having um, set several um, expedition explorer records, um, the Explorers Grand Slam, the Seven Summits record. Mm -hmm. Colin was already had a... Um, a really solid grounding on what it took to really get into flow. Um, so he understood how the flow cycle worked. Um, so it was um, less challenging for me to get him into flow. But the, the thing that was challenging about him was because he understood um, the feeling, I had to find his triggers because it, the second that you say I'm in flow, you're not in flow. 
or the second thing you say right because you can I'm, notice your infl- yeah because you're no longer present you know you're right thinking. Um, yeah. so for him, it was, it was finding the right challenge. So I had to, um, integrate into his training plan, uh, certain cognitive challenges, um, that really stressed him that really presented a challenge to that he had an experience maybe, um, in another environment, mm-hmm. um, things that he wasn't quite familiar with, but that were relatable and translatable to the event that he was training for, which in his case right. was walking across Antarctica solo and unsupported. So that was a challenge for me was um, ensuring that he was still getting stronger, ensuring that his, you know, all the physical markers were still going up. But at the same time was in order for him to complete this expedition across Antarctica, he needed to go in the flow on demand. Mm-hmm. Stuck. You know, when you're in a whiteout storm, um, setting up your <sighs> tent, um, you know, and your tent flies away, you're basically dead. Um, yeah. that's the time to give in to that release phase, right? That isn't the time to throw in to that, um, you know, give in to that, uh, that inner critic. Mm-hmm. Um, so right. So, yes. Mm-hmm. So, um, basically with Colin, um, he gave me a lot of, a, a great set of raw materials to work with. Uh, but the challenge was finding the right challenge that would actually allow him to express his personal level of, flow state. Wow, that's incredible. My gosh, I, I can't even imagine. What would work, what, yeah. what worked for you what might not work for me. So like, your trigger is yeah. mine, right? So mine could be like deep embodiment. Like I need deep embodiment to go into flow. Like I need to be doing something physical, engaging, mm. something that I'm actually work. For some people, it, that might not be it. It could be a social trigger. Like I said before, it could be like, um, you know, just a high con- high consequences. Um, right. It doesn't have to be something physical. It could be, um, and then those things might not work for me, right? So it's kind of finding what your personal triggers are. And like I said, they've, they've identified 17 um, scientifically <laughs> that work. So, Wow, I'm sure there's probably a lot more, it sounds like, because everybody's different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, that is incredible. And um, I guess my next question would be, Mike, because we kind of gla- well, we kind of glazed over how did you get into this? Because I mean, that was an incredible story that you told me about how we talked about the Navy SEAL work, but um, I also really wanted you to share some of your experience with um, your own your own personal experimentation with that after after you uh, were with the Navy SEALs. You took it into the field and and did a lot of experimentation on yourself. You're, you did the you actually broke the record for pull ups is that correct but also then you were able to pull up uh, you, you were able to pull up a rope I, something up is this right up up the the Mount Everest height is that right uh, that can't be right is it what it's close. It's close. <laughs> um, okay with, with working in seals um, I was part of what was called the Navy Seal and Soy Scout team and basically our job was to take um, seal candidates collegiate athletes. Um, and um, basically, it was a recruiting effort to create, to provide training that would produce the most qualified candidate physically and me- mentally to go through the training. Um, so in that environment, in that workspace, I, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of great mentors. Mentorship is another great way to get put in the flow because you can be guided in the, in, into flow state. Someone who is able to present those challenges for you. Um, is a good way to get into flow. In other ways, um, you just get plunged into it. I put a put you in a room with a tiger. That's you're going to be in flow state. Right. But, um, <laughs> so you know, having a mentor is a good, easy, you know, great way to, to go about that. So I recommend everyone gets a gets a mentor. Um, um, so on top of that, um, in my own endeavors, after I I did 11 years in the Navy, I was an air traffic controller, and like I said, I had experienced what I just thought was being in the zone. I didn't really have a name for it back then. I just knew that there were times where hours would fly by and people didn't die when I was Mm, working, right? Right. Um, Complex (laughs) environment. (laughs) So um, that had to be, it was something. I knew that that was, it wasn't just a, a, a feeling. It was a feeling that I felt that I didn't feel. I felt great afterwards, even when I was, you know, even during the highest stressful, most stressful moments, I felt good afterwards about it. So um, me being um, very fascinated with human performance and human potential, 
I wanted to know um, what my own, what the limits of my own uh, performance was. And I wanted to know what the thing, what are the things in my life? What are the things that I could do that could trigger this, this state for me? Mm. Right. I wanted to know what those boundaries were. So I set out, um, I created an initiative called 12 Labors Project. And one of the triggers with flow is it has to be meaningful. It has to, you have to be doing something that's meaningful for you. Oh, right. So yeah. me, I attached um, physical feats, physical efforts to charitable causes that meant something to me in my life that I had an intimate connection with. Um, veteran mental health is, issues, Parkinson's disease. You know, my dad suffered for Parkinson's for years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I had several friends who you know, took their life um, in the service. So like these, these causes, had, it brought deep meaning for me to pursue mm -hmm. them. So then attaching the physical feat um, presenting a challenge that was going to plunge me into flow. So I set the, um, the goal of breaking the world record for pull-ups. Mm. Um, the first time I did it, I failed. I bit off more than I could chew. Again, it's the challenge, setting the challenge too high and overreaching will not will be the, the, the opposite of flow. So, um, when I failed the first pull-up challenge, my inner critic was on the entire time. And uh -huh. the second, you know, my body failed. The second that, you know, my forearms tore, my biceps tore, my kidneys uh. began to shut down. Uh, my urine looked like Coca-Cola. I know it's getting kind uh. of graphic, but I, I began to really <laughs> shut down. Yeah. Um, the fact that my mind was already defeating me well before that happened didn't help my case. And mm. then I sat in the hospital for four days and just beat myself up, totally disregarding and ignoring the fact that, yeah, I inspired a lot of people. I raised a lot of money. I've completed and achieved all these other objectives just the mm -hmm. physical part of breaking the record um, didn't mean anything to me. And that's not flow. That's not a pleasant feeling. That's not a, right. you know, that, that's actually destructive, self-destructive more than anything. So I came back a year later, trained for uh, the challenge again. And I, 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 I found the piece of the puzzle is remembering your purpose, remembering mm -hmm. why you're doing it, remembering the thing that brought it meaning to begin with and using that as your anchor so that when you get to the times of extreme challenge and adversity, you can fall back on, on that anchor and that will keep you into flow for you to finish the, and succeed at the challenge. And that's what I did. So I ended up beating the world record with 5,804 pull-ups in 22 wow. hours. And I did it with a 30 pound pack on my back just to show it to myself and everyone else that you can come back stronger after failure and that flow state and tapping into your inner potential is really only limited by the beliefs that you have in yourself. It's mm -hmm. not correlated to your true capabilities. It's directly correlated to what you believe your true capabilities are. So if the belief isn't there, if the meaning isn't there, if the purpose isn't there, the, the effort won't match it, right? You, you probably likely won't succeed um, unless you're lucky. Uh, and then I went on right. to, uh, to I went on to do several other layers. Like I said, you know, once you get a taste of flow, you can't get enough. You're constantly chasing it. Mm -hmm. um, I broke the, uh, you know, I, I set a, several strongman records. I pulled a two and a half ton truck across Death Valley for 22 miles. Wow. Um, I climbed the rope, the rope climb that you were talking about. I climbed the rope um, in 27 hours. I climbed the rope um, until I reached the height of Mount Everest, so 29,030 cool. feet. Gosh. I just up and down. It was basically a 20 foot rope. I just climbed it up and down for 27 hours until I accomplished that. Um, and then I, I flipped a 250 pound truck tire for the distance of a half marathon. <laughs> and uh, most recently, I, um, uh, I ran uh, 20 miles every day for 100 consecutive days. Um, wow. That was in 2016. And then, yeah, so that those are kind of the things I do. They're increasingly difficult challenges. They're, and, and they're things that trigger my personal flow state. I'm not uh, saying people should go and do right. 5 million pull -ups. Yeah. I don't think people should pull a truck across that valley. But find what it is for you that challenges you. Find something, what it is for you that pulls you into the now and away from distractions and that allows you to express your greatness in a way that you feel great doing it. Right. Yeah. It can be anything from raising your hand to answer a question, right? In the middle of a sea of a group, a class of people or a speak a loved one, you know? or yeah, being present with your kids, right? Or your, or your spouse. Yeah. Absolutely.
And, and you know, what Mihai Chick sent me, I found, is that people that were in flow state, and, and uh, like I said, he conducted the largest study on flow to date. And he went on all over the world and asked, you know, um, sheep herders, pot, um, artists, um, dan um, salsa dancers, um, Korean mm. um, street gang <laughs> members. And he asked them, what is it that, describe the feeling when you feel your best. And they all described it as being in this flowy state. It just flowed. Mm -hmm. They said they were the happiest. And what he found is that people who were in flow were, uh, were the most happiest people um, mm -hmm. on earth. So there's a direct link between happiness and being in flow state. That's really great. Well, man, that's incredible. Um, gosh, I can't believe all the things you've done. I, do you have any plans to do anything else in the future or is that it for you for the I do. I've, I've, I've completed <laughs> six of my 12 labors, right? 12 labors projects. So I'm doing 12 I completed six. I'm planning my seventh. I took a year off to uh, focus my efforts on Colin. Mm. Um, you know, Colin, he, he, in one year, he, you know, he broke the 50 highest peaks record. He climbed the 50 highest summits in, in the country in 21 days. Then he oh, went wow. to Greenland and walked across Greenland. And then after that, he went to Antarctica and did that. So <sighs> wow. the training and, and the, I mean, it was flow on my end, just programming for him and being present with him. And yeah. actually, you know, he experienced flow working with me as well. Um, so I took that time last year to kind of focus on him. And now I'm kind of getting back into, and I needed that recovery too. Sure. Again, yeah. You know, I needed, I, my adrenals were, were pretty shy. I, I did six <laughs> labors in three years and it's just, I, oh, was, gosh. Yeah, I was pretty shot at. Yeah. You did need a break for sure. And, you know, training somebody, I mean, it's in your training, Colin, like it, that's a life and death situation to be training someone for that's serious stuff. So Absolutely. that's no joke. Um, and I feel like you already just answered my other question, which was <clears throat> how can we apply flow state to our everyday lives? And you just mentioned, you know, the, in many ways it depends on the person. It depends on really how you get into flow state. Uh -huh. About the distractions. Get the ah. distractions in your life. That is the single best way. Multi flow doesn't happen when you multitask. Mm. Single task. Focus on one thing intently and, and, and focus on that one thing one at a time. Multi they, they, they've done studies over and over on people who multitask and they've yet to find one that shows that people who are great at multitasking can do one task, ex, um, you know, exceedingly well. Oh, wow. Right? They, yeah. They bridge across the board, but they, they have yet to show a study that shows them doing at least one of those things extremely well. So flow doesn't happen in a multitask state. It's focusing, being present, focusing on the one task and giving everything you have into that moment. It's about bringing everything you have to the thing that you want the most now, right now. Um, so I would say cut the distractions, and that's people too. People yeah. are, can be distracting. Trim the fat. If someone's <laughs> not giving that positive energy, they're put, they're being you know energy vampires. Cut them loose. Cut them <laughs> loose. No. I agree. If it's not serving you, right? It it definitely we need to we need to like let it go. Yeah. And I, I remember too, being a young mom, like I was going to try to work and, and be, you know, a mother of an infant. And I decided that, you know what, this is really just having an infant is all I want to do right now. And so that I just, I let that job go and I just decided to be a mom and it was the best thing I had ever done in the world. Cause I could totally be present with my child during that time, you know? And, it, and then when I was ready to go back to work, I did it, but I stayed home with both my kids and took time off work because I was, you know, and that was in, in a sense, there was some times where there was some flow state uh, now that I think about it. Um, because, you know, you're not really thinking much. You're just, you know, you're, you're in the present moment with the little, with your little ones. So, um, but yeah, that is, uh. It's so interesting to see it that way. I love that. I love your per, the perspective and what you've shared today. So thank you, Mike. That was really great. Do you thank have, you so well, you're welcome. Um, I wanted to share with everybody how they can find you. As, as I've already said in the beginning, you're at Evolution Healthcare and Fitness, but if you want to share with them uh, a way to find you on um, through your website and as well as like what events you have coming up and or speaking engagements, feel free to feel free to share that with everybody. Sure. Um, yeah. So I have a, my website is uh, 12 labors project.com. So it's, you know, all spelled out phonetically 
Um, I'm on social media, Instagram is just Mike McCastle is my, uh, my, my handle. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Mike McCastle is real, real simple. You know, I, Mike is probably the most unique name in the world. So <laughs> your Instagram account is pretty, is pretty interesting too. So what, what is your Instagram handle also? It's Mike McCastle. Oh, it is. Okay. It's Mike McCastle too. All right. I'm going to at Mike McCastle. Cool. And um, like you said, you're coming up on real sports. You're going to be recording that show tomorrow with Colin. And so everybody look out for that. I don't know what channel that would be on, but um, HBO. H oh, that's right. HBO. I forgot. Wonderful. Well, uh, thanks again, Mike. This was a pleasure. It was such a pleasure talking to you because uh, this has been a long time coming. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm, I Thank know I'll so see much. you again soon. You're so welcome. I'll see you. I'll see you in the gym.